Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Gaines. Hello, and welcome to Chris Gaines, the podcast, the show where we take an exhaustive look at the career of country superstar Garth Brooks and his much maligned decision in 1999 to pursue a secondary pop career as a fictional character named Chris Gaines. The debut album, In the Life of Chris Gaines, was meant to be a pre-soundtrack release to a feature film entitled The Lamb a way of letting the audience get to know the character before they went to see the movie. Despite selling 2 million copies, the album was considered a complete failure and heralded an early retirement from Brooks. I'm Michael Eads. I'm Ashley Spurgeon. And this is Chris Gaines, the podcast. We're back. We're back. Here we are again. The show is brought to you by We Own This Town. You can check this out at weownthistown.net. There's lots of great podcasts on there, one of which is Hot Minute. Yay! Featuring Ashley Spurgeon. Thanks. It's hilarious. Thanks. We can be found on the internet at chrisgainespodcast.com and on Twitter at Garth Gaines SNL, which once again serves as a reminder that the fundamental goal of this podcast <laughs> is to educate you about Chris Gaines but also mainly, primarily, to somehow worm our way into the hearts and minds of Lauren Michaels and get Garth Brooks and Chris Gaines booked on a new episode of SNL. Excuse it- me. Do you have a minute to talk about Chris Gaines and Saturday Night Live? That's us. We're the evangelists, yeah, door to door. Pull you to the side. If here. you have Lauren Michaels' cell phone number, if you have his mistress's cell phone number, mm. if he has any adult children whose numbers you have, give them to us. I want to text him some ideas. So uh, last week we went over the <laughs> year of Chris Gaines, 1999, year, mm-hmm. of, year of our Lord. That's what mm-hmm. I call it. Oh, yeah. All of the events. <laughs> we, we covered all the events leading up to the release. So we thought we will get into a couple little addendums here in a second about that. I don't think I have any corrections for the episode per se. Well, I did look up Tracy Edmonds. Yes. Who is a person who has done things. Babyface's wife is not the proper way to refer to her <laughs> because she is a full-fledged human being. She is. And apparently she is a film producer as such. Yes. And has done film film production and she's currently with Dion Sanders. Good for her. I just did a little Googling. Yeah, yeah. TV host, film producer, just sort of behind the scenes woman about town. In my defense, I had looked her up on IMDb, knew that she had done some TV production work, didn't really see how it parlayed into the Chris Gaines story, but we we know now. Yeah, I mean, I think we know how. Yeah, we definitely know how. It's... We'll get there. Number one thing that I want to say about the last episode, I said the word citation one billion times. I oh, po- I, I apologize. Didn't pick up on that. Well, when I'm editing the show, I hear every word we say, and man, I said that one a lot. I say fuck too much. I'll try to. St- <laughs> I'll try to try to dial them back. Eh. Such a nice little pepper. Eh. All right. <laughs> um, I did run across a quote from the Oklahoman where Garth is talking about the project Uh and uh, mentions his mother's sickness. This is kind of like a a little bit of context around everything we've been talking about. I thought this was interesting. Uh, He says, the Chris thing gave me something to do during mom's battle with cancer. Yeah. It was like the old days, just five guys in a little house. So it's a nice call back to Santa Fe, his original band. And I don't know. I, I don't know when this would have happened. Like he recorded the album in 98 for sure. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know how long she was sick yeah. for. So Who that knows? Give, it could be years, you gives know? Gives us a little context yeah. on that. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about that really bugged me from the last episode was talking about Chris Gaines as an alter ego, which is the wrong word to mm-hmm. use. But there's a lot of other artists who have done characters, done personas. Yeah, yeah. Beyonce's Sasha Fierce, David Bowie's Thin White Duke, or Ziggy Stardust. All, there's a long All of list. Them, yeah. Uh, Lady Gaga's Allie. Hank Williams was Luke the Drifter. Paul McCartney had Percy Thrillington and some other fireman projects. See, I wouldn't even count Allie. I don't count any of them. Mm. None of those are good examples. 
there I can't think of a a one to one with what Chris Gaines was. Yeah, it's not an alter ego. It's, it's a character. Allie is a character from a movie of mm-hmm. five different versions of A Star Is Born. So here's the Star Is Born story. Here's the same basic character. We're just going to change the name. You're Allie instead of Meredith or Gertrude because it's not 1935. <laughs> Thin White Duke, all the David Bowie stuff. Those are those are like I'm going to make an album and I you know right. I'm going to do it in a different way. I'm going to just think yeah. differently. I'm yes. going to think differently about my art project. But I'm not going to really alienate my audience. Everyone's going to pick up on this. Uh, and also David Bowie had an audience that is like less prone to alienation, I ah, suppose. Yes. David Bowie's Bowie's natural audience is, I suppose, the already alienated to some extent, <laughs> yes. you know? And it's like, give us the skinny Nazi, you know? Yeah. Like, whatever. What were some of the others you mentioned? Oh, I don't, I can't speak to the Hank Williams. Yeah, um, uh, you know, that was still very traditional country. I just listened to a little bit of it today, but he allowed himself to talk about deeper subject matter. Like, there's a song about divorce and how divorce is bad and how mm-hmm. that affects other people that he didn't feel like he could do as Hank Williams. Yeah, then, I mean... You know, that sounds to me like confines of the genre. You know what I mean? It's like that's country music's problem and not anyone else's. But what we know of Chris Gaines is what we say at the top of the show. This was an album meant to introduce the audience to a character, Mm -hmm. not an alter ego, so that you would know this person before you went to see the movie. Yes. And as Michael and I were discussing before we started recording, you don't need to know who the characters are before you go into any movie. I used the example of just off the of my head Casablanca right you don't walk into Casablanca really pissed because you don't know Rick's backstory <laughs> well you know what I mean yeah. it's like it's like well how did this how did he end up in Casablanca what's right. this American doing here right it's like you didn't walk in expecting to read his journal 1930 to 1939 all about his like affair with Ilsa and how that collapsed totally you don't walk into the movie already knowing that shit that's the point any of the movie. movie any movie any movie is to tell a story yeah. and it's like I mean there are obviously like films based on books and things like right. that or you know how A Star is Born was a remake of something already but you don't <laughs> I don't know it's just ridiculous it's really, really funny to me. Yeah. It's really funny to me. It's almost like you're not allowed to celebrate Easter this year until you've read this book about the Easter bunny. Yeah. No Christmas tree until you've read all about St. Nicholas. Right. Like, oh, okay. I didn't know that that was the rule now. Warm up on your pagan traditions very if you want odd. gifts. Uh, it's very bizarre. And I've, I've been struggling with it. Honestly. Uh, yeah. Um, so I do want to jump on a little bit of fan feedback that we got. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, of, one of our listeners was listening to the podcast as they drove through Oklahoma. <gasps> Pulling off onto Garth Brooks Boulevard. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's that's the best we could do right there. Oh. Listening to us talk about Garth Brooks as you pull onto Garth Brooks Boulevard. My heart is so warm and I am so honored. <laughs> yes. So thank you for that. And then uh, we had someone tweet at us. Mr. Paul Hinman asks, number one question I have, why is Gaines Australian but a brunette? Who has ever met a non-beach blonde <laughs> Australian. Wow. Well, Chris didn't want to be a swimmer, he so he was be. indoors practicing exactly. guitar. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Ashley's a scholar on Chris Gaines. Answers your question immediately. I know indoor kids. Uh, yeah. If you do have questions for us at Garth Gaines SNL, look, we're going to read them on the air yeah. and answer them directly. Uh, this week, we wanted to talk about the critical reception of the Chris Gaines project. Mm-hmm. We went through all of the things that happened from the Garth Brooks perspective, and we didn't really touch on how the world reacted to it. So we wanted to go a little bit through some press, just yeah. a little bit. One thing that Ashley brought up as you know, we're researching this every week. <laughs> This is not some. We did a ton of research beforehand, and then we continue to do research. And, and we, can, we discover new stuff every day. And we continue to find things every day. We learn ways to manipulate Google and Billboard <laughs> and Getty Images and Archive.org in ways that we didn't know before. Mm-hmm. So one thing that Ashley has come across that is absolutely fascinating and kind of reframes a lot of this for me is an article about the inception of the lamb and the history of the lamb and how far back it goes. We posited 1998 he was talking about Mm -hmm. it. We have semi-confirmation that that was happening. We know at the end of 98 he talks about it. We heard that he's talking about it in the summer. 
So summer, we know about rumors. By the fall, there's a press release. But it had to happen before that. Absolutely. Maybe even years. 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 (laughs) Okay, so here's this article from Variety from 1998, which mentions Sanderson. What was her first name? Lisa, I believe. Lisa Sanderson, who was Red Strokes Strokes. Entertainment. Another terrible name. Another first pass (laughs) at a name. Red Strokes yes. Entertainment, which either makes me think of masturbation or a red pen where you're marking up like a shitty draft of something. Uh, either way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so this article from 1998 says Brooks and Sanderson have been developing the lamb for several years and recently brought it to Tracy and Kenny Edmonds. Uh, Tracy and Kenneth, a.k.a. Babyface Edmonds, who have a first look deal at Fox. All four pitched the project to execs in a number of studios, including Paramount's Sherry Lansing. It goes on to say Sanderson wouldn't rule out the possibility of an acting role for Brooks, but said, we're committed to making the best possible movie. We're going to develop the script and define the characters first. <laughs> that's <laughs> there fair. There it is. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. a great idea. Focus on the script. Develop the characters later. So that was the plan in late 98. But that's October 98, which is a month before Garth says anything about it to the press. Mm-hmm. And they've been developing it for years. years. I mean, that's... Impressive. Four years. <laughs> yeah. And they never really got that far. <laughs> I mean, they do get Paramount to sign on, which is something. Garth? Garth is here? Yeah. Sure. I mean. Well that's, signed, baby face. That's something. They Didn't... get Jeb Stewart, the writer of Die Hard and The Fugitive, mm-hmm. to agree to write the script. Yeah. And Babyface and Tracy, they had produced Soul Food in 97. That was a hit. That was a hit. You know, and I think one other film. Like, they had already made money for people. Right. By so they were point. a pretty good yeah, bet, yeah. I guess. So that's a, just a very interesting note to remember when you're learning about these critical receptions. This didn't just happen. This has been worked on for so long. Years pitching it, years fleshing out the characters, picking the songs, recording the songs. Like, so much work's been put into this. And it's like, but where's Jeb? You know what I mean? It's like the actual writer is nowhere to be seen. That's true. You know? That's true. At any point. (laughs) Jeb, if you're out there, if you're listening, please reach out to us. Can you show us the pages, Jeb? Yeah. Jeb, pull out that dusty old file. Two pages. We're not asking a lot. Photocopies. (laughs) (laughs) I don't even want a PDF. No. No. Just no. With that in mind, we go back into 1999. We're back in the world of promoting the record. Garth has announced it. He mentions it briefly in November of 98. He gets the full press release in March of 1999 with that amazing photo of everyone sitting at the press conference Mm -hmm. table. And for the most part, you don't really find a lot of press about it until the summer. Yeah. So... That's kind of to be expected. It's pretty much slated for a September release. So, you know, the album's going to be worked. The first single is going to be worked a couple months before that. Just to give those of you who are not Nashvillians a little bit of context on how a record label does some things. You hire a radio promoter who sends out promotional copies of the album or a specific single. And then you call that radio station every week and you say, hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, what'd you think of that single? You going to add it to rotation? And you do that every week. This is 1999. Email is a thing, but it's not a thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of really tight relationships where, like, literally people call radio stations, hundreds of radio stations every week and find out. When does the payola come in? Uh, Day one. Okay. Day one. (laughs) You uh, slip the money in the CD case and the jewel case. All right. Yeah. So labels also hire PR companies um, who have relationships with these program directors, the people who choose the songs for their stations. Not so much the case in 2019 anymore. You got a lot of corporate conglomerates. Jack with, FM. Yeah. It's just a shuffle, iPod shuffle. Trickling down from the top on a pre-selected list. But in 1999, it was different. Um, not that different. Well, not that different. It was still corrupt. And, Clear Channel yeah. was everywhere. That was like more than half of the radio stations in the country or something, but right? But the beast is more powerful now. More powerful. I it's, would... You would the argue. radio beast? Yeah. The radio beast is less powerful than it's ever been, and it's more less powerful every single day. We're on a podcast, dude. Oh, They're man. like, trust me. They're... My cheeks just turned bright red. <laughs> 
very true. So uh, labels also hire publicists who contact all kinds of publications and try and get write-ups and interviews and features. Ash- I ignore those. Ashley knows this very well. I unsubscribe from so many things. <laughs> How'd you get my fucking email? Unsubscribe block. You go to South by Southwest you sign, once. Oh my God, you get one free drink. Yeah. The- <laughs> yeah. Uh, and those people also book them for appearances on yeah, like yeah. Conan and Saturday Night Live. That's the cool part. That's the very cool part. So one of the earliest press releases that I stumble upon is a Billboard article from July 1999. The headline is Brooks set as fictitious pop star from Capital. And Brooks is pretty explicit about the intent of the album. Brooks says, there's no story here about an alter ego. There's no story here about Garth wanting to break out of country. There's no story here about Garth getting so fed up he's got to stretch out. If I hadn't been approached by Paramount, I would have made this album and played it in my house. I'd never have put it out because it's not what I am. That's the second bit of information that's turning my head just completely over. Like, this project existed for years prior to what we all assumed. Yeah. And Garth is saying, if I hadn't been approached by Paramount, this is a, a personality that, that I'm taking on. What year is this? Is this summer of 99? Summer of 99. You see, it's it's like I'm not even the, – the latter half of that quote is less interesting to me than the first half because that is a man who is exasperated, who has already tried to explain over and 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 over again what he's actually trying to do, and they're still not getting it. He's like, no, it's not an alter ego. No, I'm not tired of country. No, I'm not trying to do this. No, I'm not trying to do that. He's really, really insistent that this is just a fictional character. Fictional character for a fictional movie 100% 100% make-believe. He's doing a soundtrack. I'm just doing a movie soundtrack, right. basically, is what he's trying to say here. But we also know that he's been developing the character for years at this point. Right, right. And to- we also know that you and Babyface and Babyface's wife and the woman who's going to sue you 13 years from now kind of took it to Paramount. Yeah. So we kind of know that. Yeah. That's interesting. It's very interesting. You I, know? I give him credit for being consistent. I mean, in that November article where he first talked to the press about it in He's like, movies is the same. It's entertainment. I'm a character. Mm-hmm. Like he, he has a through line that's consistent. So maybe that frustration has been there for a while. Yeah, it's uh, I've, I've just so many of here's an Oklahoman article from September 25th, the Oklahoma 1999. When quizzed about his intentions, Brooks set out on a very matter of fact plan. In a phone interview from Nashville, the artist talked about gains, the future and his family. OK, who is the undisputed king of country? Brooks asked it's Hank Williams Sr. He recorded as Luke the Drifter. The Stetler brothers have recorded as the Roadhog, so I'm not that far away. Brooks is well aware that many of his country fans are baffled about gains. I know it's not their Garth, but either they'll get it or they won't, he said. That's another through line I'm finding over and over again, yeah. and not just from Garth, but from like publicity stuff. It's like, are country fans going to be confused? But it's really right. insulting. It's really, honestly, very, very rude. It's like, are they too fucking stupid to understand that this is a different thing? It's like, no, they're not because they didn't buy it. Right. Actually, they completely understood that it was a different thing and no one wanted it. Well, the interesting <laughs> thing is they weren't even that exposed to it because they work this to adult contemporary radio. Exactly. They didn't work it to country radio because they wanted this to be an AC single. Mm -hmm. So it actually, Lost in You actually makes it into the top 10 adult contemporary radio singles and it goes, the video goes into large rotation at VH1. Great. Yeah. Cool. But there's a lot of discouraging words from these program directors around what is this thing? Chris Huff from WUSY in Chattanooga says, everyone I played it for says it sounds like Kenny Loggins. (laughs) Uh, Robin James in Roanoke, Virginia, WJLM said, if it is pop, it ain't country. So I ain't playing it. Much as I love Garth, I had an identity crisis once too. (laughs) That guy had not heard the album yet, but I love his quote. There's a lot of... Just uh, along those lines, basically. There's a huge Billboard article just weeks later from the original one, just interviewing program directors. Like, what do you think of this? What does your audience think of this? And they're baffled pop doesn't want to play it because it's garth brooks as chris gaines they don't want to play garth brooks on their pop station but they would have played it if they were good pop songs they would have played it if they were better pop songs arguably yes absolutely if one of those songs had the staying power of like smash mouth's all-star oh no it would have been like all over 
I don't disagree, but it's the difference between breaking a new artist and using the leverage of Garth Brooks. I don't think they would have played it if it was if it was a great pop song. I think if it was Garth Brooks, super good pop, I think they would have been they would have shied away from it simply because it was Garth Brooks. Do you think that if the song was good enough? I think if the song is good enough, no one cares. I think if the song is good enough, absolutely no one cares. I guess that's the story of Taylor Swift. Uh, It's the story of Lil Nas X. It's the story of. Oh, oh my God, R. Kelly. I mean, do you want to play this game? You know, if the music is good enough, no one gives a fuck who performs it. Man, they you, do not care. You played the R. Kelly card. I mean, That's we play, I played the R. Kelly card because we were looking at what was adult contemporary music in 1999. And R. Kelly and Celine Dion had a duet at the top of yeah. the adult contemporary charts in 1999. Wild. You know? Oof. Yeah. I'm just stating the facts. <laughs> So lots of great quotes from these Billboard articles. In fact, this first one, uh, we'll link it on the episode detail page for this episode. Just wild amounts of amazing information. So Capitol Records Group president and CEO Roy Lott says his goal for the album is, quote, to sell more than the recent Garth Brooks studio albums. The album Sevens had sold six million copies at the time. (laughs) So the goal was... As much as a Garth Brooks album. You had mentioned that quote before. I just love it so much. Uh, I just wanted to languish in it for just a little bit. It's such like a fat cat kind of quote. It's like you can see like the cigar he's chomping on. Like the goal is to sell as many records as we can. The goal is to make money. You know, it's like I appreciate the candor. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. (laughs) Stacey Condi from Capital VP of Marketing said, It's a fun project, but Garth head checks us when we get too giggly. The main thing we need to do is educate the public. It's not Garth Brooks dressed up in some weird moppy wig and outfit. This character is a movie hero. This album is trying to set up everyone early so that they care about the character and go along for the ride. (laughs) That same through line. It kind of is Garth Brooks in a weird moppy wig and outfit. Like... It, Absolutely. I, I, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at, here's a CNN review from September 27th, 1999. Ooh, that's like the day it's released. I know. And it's it's an album review. Uh, the pre-soundtrack to the film that has not been scripted yet. The exercise is called a concept album. So oh. they're just breaking hmm. down what a concept album is. Hardly an unheard of marketing device. They very explicitly call it. But the musical direction Brooks is taking is new for him. Critics say he's looking for a way to draw crossover pop success without alienating his hardcore country fans. Brooke says he's releasing the album before the film because he wants people to come familiar with the Gaines character before they see the lamb. And again, I just, that's, this to me is like, if I learn a new fact, and then I act like the whole world has learned a new fact, you know? I, I use an example. It's like, did you know that Alice Coltrane made records too? You know what I mean? I'm really getting the vibe that's like, maybe Garth Brooks specifically has a problem with going into a movie and not knowing anything about the character, but like, this is not a problem that anyone else in the world has. Like, this is a you thing, buddy. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It's really funny to me. I'm just imagining Garth going to see The Exorcist and like, well, who's Linda's teacher's name? Right. You know? Yeah. Like, Amazing. how many how many number one records has she had? This is total speculation, but maybe the pace of movie making was really aggravating to him. So slow. Like he's putting out album after album, year after year, and selling millions of copies. Very good point. And now he's in production, not even pre-production. He's shopping this thing for years, trying to get it off the ground, and finally gets a deal with Paramount and is like, you know what? I'm ready to go with this thing. Let's put out an album. And of course, Capital's going to be like, mm, okay, if we, can get, <laughs> if we can get six million copies yeah. out of it, sure, Absolutely. why not? Absolutely. Have uh, two. Yeah. You know? like So maybe it was the pace of it all, and that's why he's like, no, 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 it's the character. It'll get you to know him, and it helps him put something out constantly. He's also, at this point in his life, at the cusp of reaching 100 million records sold. I think he sold like 95 million records total in like 98, mm. 99. He's like right there. Yeah. So if he can sell 5 million more, he's like, he's broken this record, this ceiling that no one else has done or few have done. So that's a thing to think about as well. Just to give you a, a snippet of uh, more press that was not so 
kind. There's a Variety review from September 29th, 1999. This guy says, The industry's surest bet sheds his wranglers and bolo tie for hipper duds and a new sound, and the result is as unimpressive as Pat Boone's dive into heavy metal. Did you know that Pat Boone did a heavy metal record? I did because that was the Osbournes theme song. Wasn't it the Pat Boone crazy train? Pat, but he did a, he did a record of metal songs, I believe, in the style of Pat Boone. Am I yes, mistaken? in a jazzy big band style. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was, I did know that because it was the, the crazy train was the theme song for the Osbournes show on MTV. And I remember seeing like, Pat Boone in like a leather vest yeah. and like I remember this yeah. yeah I really thought I was going to bring something fascinating to the table for you but you know it all I'm already. sorry <laughs> but you know but um, you know what is fascinating is Garth is Alexander the Great there are no more worlds to conquer for oh. him there are no more worlds to conquer for him in country music in the 90s the, he he owned the it's he true. owned the 1990s and it's like 100 million records what else can you do yeah, what else can you do what else can you do but he does have quotes that's saying that that's not that's not his goal like maybe do you think I that's just press him. like that's just what he's supposed to say yeah i do i really do think it's press it's what he's supposed to say they, but, yeah. you've made this point before that the biggest pop star in the world a beyonce for example is going to be way 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 bigger than the ceiling of garth brooks the biggest country star will mm-hmm. never be as big as the biggest pop star. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to your point, if he's conquered everything that he could conquer, except for pop, or at least he's conquered everything he can conquer in country, he's Mm -hmm. still... At a lower level. Yeah. He's not there. If you're the number one country performer on planet Earth, you are still below the number one pop performer. You're still below the film actors. Yep. And just in terms of like A-list, B-list, you know, D-list movie stars are more popular than TV stars are more famous than TV. It, it just is. Yeah. It just is. There are more people who listen to pop music than the country music. That's just a fact. Like Michael Jackson is more famous than Johnny Cash. I hate to break it to you. It's true. That's true. <laughs> Don't hate to break it to me. Yeah. It's just a fact. Some, uh, some positive reviews. Did you find any of those? <laughs> I have one. I've, I mean, on Amazon, the Amazon.com reviews are really nice. Of, of Chris Gaines? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Amazon reviews are really nice. Like, I bought this for my mom, and she drives around in her car because she doesn't have a CD player in her house. Yeah. That is amazing. Those are great. The Kitsap Sun, I have no idea where that is, but the Kitsap Sun says, uh, most impressively, Brooks pulls it off. The album has a retro feel. It's designed to be a greatest hits of tunes from a fictional character's last 15 years, and Brooks, though writing none of the songs and singing in higher keys than his country hits, sounds entirely believable. Okay. Sounds believable is an interesting compliment. I mean, to he give. sounds like uh, sounds like he the sounds character. like a guy named Chris. He yeah. Sounds like the guy named he Chris. He sounds like a guy named Chris. Uh, Kitsap County is in the U.S. state of Washington. <sighs> I love him. I'm just the CNN interview again is the state of something that I'm going to talk about a little maybe is just the state of music journalism in 1999 also was odd. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, I don't have much to say because most of it is going to be like memory, I guess. But you well, what's the media landscape of 1999? You, you're a young man who's going to go buy some CDs, buy some records. What are you looking for for reviews and like critical assertions that you trust? I'm going to buy a spin. Mm-hmm. A Rolling Stone. Yeah. Uh, maybe some sort of alt something. Yeah. I read CMJ a lot. And that's it. Period. What All of those were what? For white boys? And magazines. Yes, magazines. They're magazines. Yes. So music criticism at this point is almost, because uh, there's no internet, really. Right. There are some blogs, you right. know, some nerds with Before their blogs. Before people get super upset, yes, there was internet, of course. I was on internet in 1999, <laughs> bold.com, but it was magazine writers. It was, yeah. and these are legacy magazines. So and it's like there's gatekeeping, all, you know, it's Absolutely. like it's your, your same horde of freelancers. It's your same staff writers and it's going to be like white guys. And it's like rockist, rockist versus pop. I mean, the whole reason like poptimism kind of happened is because shitty music writers in the fucking 90s like started to suck really bad, I guess. <laughs> there reaches a point. 
not even in the 90s. I mean, honestly, Lester Bangs has a lot to atone for. Whoa, calling him out. I mean, what? You know, there's an attitude. Yeah, there's, th absolutely. There's, 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 there's a person who's more drawn in by the attitude and the authority of having the attitude than actually like trying to critically engage with something. Yeah. And I don't have any time for that. Yeah, I don't I mean, have any time for that. That's uh, the stereotype of a rock critic, right? It's yeah, just like, and that's hates the, everything. And that's the vast majority of the people who are going to be reviewing Chris Gaines. Correct. Reviewing Chris Gaines, especially at, like Rolling Stone spin, anything right. like that. And even the like more sort of mainstream publications like CNN, I mean, they're still like don't really know what they're talking about. It's really fascinating. I'm it's the a concept album. It's a concept album that says that I'm really <laughs> I'm in love. Love that um, that's him on the cover, garbed in black, sporting a kind of Johnny Rotten look. Whoa, nope. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Actually, we were talking before we started recording. Uh, Chris Gaines is the closest thing we've figured out is Savage Garden. Absolutely. Savage it's Garden. So they're, close. they're Australian, number one. Number two, it's like rock pop with maybe rock first, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like there was a guitarist in the group. Yeah. Uh, his name was Daniel Johns. I don't even need to look it up. <laughs> and that, yeah, if you listen to the the 1997 Savage Garden album, I believe it's self-titled, the one with the Chicka Cherry Cola song, pick any non-hit on that record, they're gonna be a, they're gonna be like kind of crappy rock songs, and they're really gainsy. Really gainsy. And they're like honestly a little harder rockin'. <laughs> oh, they're way harder. We way listened harder to a little rockin'. Bit. Like Savage Garden was kicking ass compared to Chris Gaines. Yeah, the CNN things first of all says less girth, Garth. That's a subhead, so that's mean. It's just mean. So yeah. just mean. Just mean. Right there, the occasionally pudgy country singer lost weight and wore mascara for the photo shoot. It's like are you just hitting your word count there. That's just rude. <laughs> the first single, Lost in You, features Brooke singing in falsetto and sounding like Tracy Chapman. From there, the pop sound dredges up images of the Fad Four, Bob Dylan, Fleetwood Mac, and others. I mean, just even words like dredge you know right. it's like pulled it you up. couldn't say evoke you're right right you know dredged it up from the, that's it's, it's the they, they're not fans for the most part the sound is middle of the road the songs aren't pithy or saccharine but they aren't jewel material either i don't even know what that's supposed to wow like, yeah, that's imply. a hard slap that's a hard slap yeah not even jewel material they're not even jewel material because she was the softest of the soft i would assume to a to a rock critic oh jewel, yeah you know? and i remember when jewel came out with what intuition i believe that was oh two and that was when she went harder. Right. The and she reinvented was like, jewel. Yeah, she was like, I'm wearing a tank top now. <laughs> She's not sleeping in a van no more. <laughs> 2003 intuition. What was that one from? What was that quote from? That was from a CNN article written by Mary Jo DeLondaro. Calling them out. We're calling them out left and right. <laughs> uh, there's a Entertainment Weekly review that's got some pretty harsh words to say about the whole thing. But the line I love the most, which is obviously the worst line. But the gimmick feels as cowardly as it does brave. Ooh. Wow. Wow. I think it's the opposite of cowardly. I think it's the opposite of cowardly. David Brown disagrees. I don't see how it's cowardly because you can't hide it. You know what I mean? It's not like he did do like a Thrillington thing where he just like released a record and put it out right. and didn't tell anyone. I'm not saying that's cowardly. It's just, you know. Garth is extremely forthcoming about what I this am is. Chris Gaines. Yes. Yeah, he's so explicit. And it was <laughs> he gets very NBC brave. on board right. a couple times. Yes. <laughs> you yeah. know? I don't find any cow. I see ego. I see short sightedness. I see boredom. Mm -hmm. I don't see cowardice. And I think we can all look at these reviews and say, it didn't go well. <laughs> it did not go well Just at all. in general. So I think the, the Kitsap Sun is one of the few positive reviews. Mm -hmm. There's an MTV review from around the same time that says positive things about him, but not that much. They're mostly just pulling quotes from the press release and maybe something from Don was yeah. about he has summoned up the long gone thrill of innovation, adventure and risk that once was the foundation of rock and roll music. That <laughs> not to oversell it. Not to oversell it. And that segues into a bit that I want us to talk about that's about the genres used mm -hmm. in this entire kerfuffle, whatever, this whole thing. Chris Gaines is a rocker. Yeah. 
Okay. I haven't heard any rock songs yet. So I went and researched what was considered rock in 1998, 99 in the top rock charts of that Mm -hmm. time. We've got Days of the New, Pearl Jam, Kiss, Lenny Kravitz, Metallica, Everlast, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Def Leppard, Creed. Nothing of Chris Gaines sounds like that. No. I'm not saying I like those songs. I'm saying... I can at least recognize Creed as a rock band. Right. Exactly. I'm not saying they're a good rock band that I like, but that's a rock song, you know? So if if it's not rock, then it's adult contemporary because that's who they're pitching mm-hmm. to, right? Slash R&B. So we've got R. Kelly with Celine Dion, Sarah McLaughlin, Phil Collins, Backstreet Boys, another Celine Dion single, and Savage Garden mm-hmm. in 1999. Getting closer, for sure. Yeah. And then in 1999, in R&B, you've got Whitney Houston. Buster- What's the Whitney Houston song? It is Heartbreak Hotel featuring Faith Evans and Kelly Price. Okay. Busta Rhymes with Janet. Who's it going to be? <gasps> that song fucking rules. <laughs> that was 1999. How's it going to be? Going to make, going to make, going to make your body wet. <laughs> uh, and it was another way home. TLC. No, no scrubs. scrubs. Yeah. Destiny's Child. Bill, bills, 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 bills. 1999. This is it. This is the chart. So, yeah, this is. That was in junior high. So and just thinking about what's at the top of these charts in 1999. They're not rock. No, 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 no. So and Chris Gaines is not a rocker. So he's kind of done. There's this amazing dichotomy constantly happening. You can't pitch Garth to AC radio because they don't want to play Garth. You can't pitch Chris Gaines to country radio because it's pop. Like there's yeah. this dichotomy. So now you have the same thing. You've got a rocker, but you don't really want to put out rock music because it's not popular anymore. You want to put out R&B. And also, it's like, this is rock music over the course of 15 years. Here's the evolution of this man's career right. from the mid-80s to the present day, roughly 1999. But it's like, your 80s rock sounds like the 60s. It doesn't sound like Def Leppard. It doesn't even sound like Prince, who is supposed to be like a touchstone right. within this. It's like, he's the new Prince. There's nothing that sounds like Prince. Any era of Prince. Right. Maybe like a, vi- a poor, poor knockoff. Yeah. You could get there. With your eyes closed and maybe really thinking hard, you could get there. <laughs> like Chevron Park. I don't know. But I think it's interesting to talk about what you're talking about with rock. Rock critics are very snarky mm-hmm. and just pithy almost. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even have anything to do with the music. They, of course they're not going to like this. Like this is a- There is no there I cannot This is 100% speculation, but I can honestly say I don't think any rock critic would have engaged with that album in good faith. I don't think anyone would have given it a good faith listen. No. Like, From oh, the time fuck Garth. Yeah. Like, multi-million. No, no, no. Fuck you. Who, who right. are you? What do you? No. Absolutely. Stay in your lane. Like, there's uh. no way that anyone was going to, like, give it a listen. And, like, you and I at least are able to concede, <laughs> like, right. oh, somewhat catchy. You've caught me humming, digging for gold, you right. know, like our least favorite song on the record. It's horrible, <laughs> but, it's, but still, we, it's catchy. It's catchy. Yeah. yeah. So I think I just think that's a fascinating thing. And I think maybe I'm going to go as far as to say like a little prescient in a way, because I think Garth saw, I don't know, this is speculation, but I think Garth saw that that's the way music was going and that he was a mm. rocker because that's what Garth liked and that's who Garth kind of connected with the kisses and the you know the hard rockers of the world but he knew that the music wasn't going that direction the music world is not going that way pop yeah. music is R&B music R&B influence exactly exactly yeah and that's hence babyface right very helpful and the songwriters, the song with the Tommy Sims and the Don was, it's like they had done the Eric Clapton song, but that, you know, it wasn't a rock song. That's an adult contemporary Eric right. Clapton song right. as well. And I think the whole Chris Gaines story of like going to Mississippi and finding soul and all that, which is just unbelievably silly, you know, it explains why the whole album kind of sounds like R&B. You know, I think that's the trigger for the album is like that's the trick of the album is that that gives you that entry, that game. Way. Mm. What do you think? I mean, I'm just wondering how much time Garth has actually spent in Mississippi. I mean, he's toured there, I'm he's sure. He's toured there, but how much time has he spent outside of an arena since 1989? I couldn't tell you. You know what I mean? I'm just He probably how didn't much? go down to where down Robert to the Delta. Johnson, he didn't you know, like, <laughs> he, sold the soul. He's not at the crossroads at midnight. No. He's just not. I, uh, we didn't get a rock album, which kind of breaks my heart because I feel like a Garth rock. It's it's here's the thing. It's like there was the idea of what Chris Gaines was. Chris Gaines is a rock 
alter ego of Garth Brooks. That's the wide story that's yep. 100% incorrect. Correct. That's You are correct in that that is incorrect. Yeah. So what Chris Gaines was, was a fictional character with lots of backstory written by Brooks, songs written by other people, and about half of them performed by, more than half performed by Brooks. What I want is the like Garth Brooks rock album that didn't happen. It's like, I would love to hear a Garth Brooks album that's inspired by Kiss, inspired by Fleetwood Mac, inspired by Billy Joel, inspired by these arena rock artists that he grew up with. I would love, man, Garth Garth could kill like a Captain and Tennille joint. He really could. Absolutely. You know, like. Without a doubt. Garth already kind of is Bruce Springsteen, you know? Yeah, oh, for sure. You know, he is. Yeah, I'm going to stick with that. And he is probably more like Springsteen of all of those artists. You know what I mean? Honestly, sure. like if I had to compare him to any of them, it would always on the road. Here are my big anthems. Songs you for know, the people. Songs for the people. I'm the working man. It's mm-hmm. like New Jersey, Oklahoma. What's the difference? Nothing. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it functionally. It, So it's like, that's what I want, and that's not what it was. It's like these R&B light songs that are so boring. Yeah. Are so boring. Yeah. It's light R&B. Occasionally poppy, mostly boring. Yeah. For us. For us. There there were two million people that feel differently, and that's cool. Yeah, all the people who bought it on Amazon.com absolutely love it. And I was looking at these reviews were written in 2016, 2017, 2018. You know, people are going in, spending the $43 or whatever on the, I don't know what edition it was. I don't know. Maybe it was shipped from Japan. Y'all, go on eBay. It's $4. They are spending dozens of dollars on Amazon. (sighs) I know. Don't need to do that. It's not a rock album. Even the rockingest elements of it are R&B pop. Absolutely. So I think that pretty much sums up one of the biggest problems with the critical (laughs) reception of Chris Gaines is that he's a rocker who wrote an album of R&B songs pitched to adult contemporary radio. Uh, How's that going to work? Okay. Yeah. His voice is, fu- you know, it's like there's a lot of talk about his voice. It's like he's he's lost his country gravel and has picked up a falsetto or right. whatever. I'm just like not as impressed by that as I'm expected to be, I suppose. It's like right. he's a good singer. Congratulations for continuing to sing good. Right. Like yeah. that's your job, dude. Right. Like good. Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> He was happy with the playing on the album. I haven't gone back to listen to it uh, from that standpoint yet. I need to go back and really just pick up those drum fills, I guess, and really just soak it in. He was happy with the playing. (laughs) Well, do we got anything else for today? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I almost just kind of want to keep reading these reviews. Here's this New York Times 1999, September 1999. Conceptually, however, Mr. Brooks deserves a pat on the hat for the undertaking. Detractors accuse him of using the pseudonym because he is too chicken to risk failure with a rock album under his own name, like you said. Others say it's part of Mr. Brooks' attempt to rule the entertainment world, to sell more albums than the Beatles. The only act has ever outsold him. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it just 100% of all of the press, all of the press is like trying to explain what it is and therefore it has already failed. Yes. Uh, before anything's even started, when you're having to explain yourself over and over and over again, oh my God. I found one where it was talking about the lamb that wasn't even like written. And s- I think it was like a CNN review or maybe it was New York Times and they were saying something like, well, from what it sounds like, maybe it'll be a Citizen Kane kind of thing where it's flashbacks to you know because of this, it's already started with his death and an obsessive female fan I found it was a, an obsessive woman fan and oh. some of the stuff I found today which I w- was assuming it was male in my head I don't know why you're talking about the plot of the lamb the plot of the lamb the unknown plot of the and lamb and so it, all of Chris's life and career was going to be told through like flashbacks or something I don't know you see this is again this is a device where I wish we had the screenwriter <laughs> Come on, Jeb. Jeb. Get in touch with us. Jeb. I've emailed your agent. Tell him to email back. <laughs> the hero's journey. Who goes on it? it like, I'm, I'm cu- I just want to know everything about it. I feel like I could write a pretty decent... I could write the lamb. Oh, don't throw that gauntlet down. I would love to see that. I could do it. And then we could do a reading here on the show. <laughs> I could do, you know, don't, don't box me in, but I'll try to get a scene together before the end of the podcast. All right. Maybe, maybe when he's in the hospital and oh, with the, he's writing yeah. an unwritten, unsigned letter. Mm-hmm. I'll pick one of the songs and just work backwards from there. Huh. Which <laughs> well, I've got an additional layer of challenge for you. Ooh. Only one draft. Oh, one song, one draft. No second drafts. 
That's the Garth Brooks way. No <laughs> second draft. <laughs> There's absolutely not. <laughs> There's not. We've been over this. The Touch Em All Foundation for his kids' charity. Like... Red Stroke Entertainment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Big Fat Ass Records. Sure, let's go. Cut it. Print it. Like, okay, Garth. Oh, my God. All right. We're going to call it. I think we covered all the things that we said we wanted to cover. Turns out the critical reception of Garth Gaines was uh, not great. <laughs> So, get at us, chrisgainspodcast.com. Tweet at us at Garth Gaines SNL. I'm Michael Eads. I'm Ashley Spurgeon. This is Chris Gaines, the podcast. Talk at you next time. Do you know what Johnny Rotten Just looks like? Just like Johnny Rotten. Was seen or at- War?